the objects you're seeing um, moving there is a form of levitation by uh, translational movement, meaning that the objects become lighter and can float around, the heaviest being the barium cylinder that you see there um, with the two wires coming out of it. it tends to slide around on seven pounds of its own weight. The physics of it is self-resonation of what they call ferromagnetic and piezoelectric barium type name. Uh, through a power amplifier and broad and narrow uh, bands of electrical energy going into this crystal. So the applications of this in advanced applications using free energy or zero-point energy to power it would be in uh, propulsion technologies. This is a crystal converter unit that I made about a year ago to see if the principle worked and indeed it seems to work to this day. Um, the principles involve the Casimir effect and uh, space charge type of barrier technology in semiconductors and um, a, a jitter activity called zero-point energy that goes through time and space. The idea is to get the material inside this to interface with the uh, jittering action of zero-point energy. And moving on to what they may look like inside, I actually bring out a piece here of this material of common minerals and that, produced in a special way, and I take a reading here. And I should be getting a higher reading. I have a hot spot somewhere on here. I have here almost a half a volt, as you can see. As one can see, there's no batteries in this or anything else except this crystalline material with different uh, configurations. And this is a steady state. It's always that and has been tested up to a year's time and under stress tests also. So, which made me decide to then, of course, mount the same material in cylinders. Different cylinders, of course, there are different mixes in there, and I found that uh, that some of the cylinders are not as powerful as this material here, or this very tiny one here. Actually, this has more power than this large artillery shell unit here. And what I want to do, of course, is to um, <coughs> demonstrate it in the sense of it making actual power. That means to turn a small motor. Okay, I'm attaching this to the base here. Another lead to the top, and it should spin, which it does. So, yeah, basically, this kind of material powering motors. Of course, a very small motor at this time, but scaled up in larger amounts of, of material and power up to uh, several horsepower if needed. Hutchison hopes his simple shake-and-bake method of producing these crystal energy converters will attract investors who can see the potential of permanent batteries which never need charging. Non-toxic that will interface with zero-point energy in space and time. Here we have a collection of samples from 1979 to 1989 of uh, metal pieces uh, done by the Hutchison Effect apparatus. And we're going to start with the very first sample, which uh, gained a lot of history around the world and also in a lot of uh, national laboratories, which is this very large, heavy steel bar. As you can see here, the crumbling crumbling material here is off the end of this bar here and actually is a transmuted material that has is unknown um, in the metallurgical handbooks and this particular sample has been to Germany um, to in the United States <coughs> the United States National Laboratories also in Japan and other locations and um, extremely rare material that appears to be a major uh, transmutation. Now, getting into another sample here, we find a heavy piece of what they call 
extruded brass that exploded with inside itself, ripping it into this pattern here, ripping it apart. Very heavy, dense material. This is another time frame of about 1987, 88. Coming to this sample here of aluminum, we find that something wanted to get outside of the metal itself. And looking at it, we see that the pressures inside of it indeed tried to get out. And going to samples that have um, other samples sitting on top of them, we have here a knife <coughs> that was on a sample that got itself embedded into the sample. And um, apparently some type of transparency perhaps did happen. This particular sample was anchored down and a machine was given to shave off the top layer of aluminum to get to this level here. This is extrusion alloy, not cast aluminum. And if you observe very carefully, there's a shadow of the knife itself embedded in, in the metal here on the back. Well, that's a stainless steel kitchen knife embedded in a piece of extruded alloy. We get to a piece of, again, extrusion with uh, a piece of wood inside that uh, has actually came up several times in various samples analyzed in Germany and at the National Laboratories. Wood mixed in with the structure itself. Uh, we're not sure exactly on this sample how much wood, maybe a cubic inch or more inside here. And coming to other samples, we find, again, samples that have ripped themselves apart and rejoined, as you can see in this little sample here. And then we come to breaks that indicate actually a lot of stress, as it's a nice clean cut and looks like a bent stress. So this is broken in a fashion perhaps like that. And then on the other side of the coin, we come to something that looks like it was ripped apart or turned to jelly and ripped apart and frozen in time and space. This large aluminum sample, again extrusion alloy, was once one piece and was totally uh, formed like this after some experiments, actually seen on video. We come to more hard materials such as stainless steel that have just bent and twisted around with a lot of little pot marks and pieces falling out of it. Again, similar to the large uh, piece of steel that I just mentioned, if it being the very first uh, sample. And um, this is just many of many samples that I do have and that other people do have that are still are undergoing analysis around the world. And new theories are coming up almost weekly on what has happened here. On conventional physics, it would take terawatts of power to do this. There's no radio waves or anything that can do this. There's no electrostatic fields or lightning bolts that can do this. Um, so in a way, the theory is, uh, key waves made up of electromagnetic and electrostatic fields that I produce, opening a doorway into another dimension that allows any kind of amount of energy to come in and do this to create these effects. And um, <clears throat> it must be on the order of terawatts to do this. Um, we've had larger samples, of course, fall apart and break apart. And um, basically, again, it seems to come back into a circle that uh, the universe supplies all the energy needed um, for mankind and also for uh, propulsion and space travel. I don't go into mathematics at all. I visualize things and always joust, so to speak, uh, the uh, conventional scientists or the scientists with the mathematics by saying that intuition is a shortcut through math. I visualize this and I put in the best words that I can find. I can actually see the atom. I can see the different interactions of the dimensions inside of an atom and I can explain it in, in those terms, visualize it and actually do it physically. But mathematically, I am a basket case when it comes to um, trying to understand mathematics and uh, I only use math in, in quantity. Like in electricity, I need mathematics in electromechanical engineering.
engineering I need mathematics, it's just me basic measurements. But um, when it comes to the exotic math, I'm a lost cause, so I must rely on intuition, which gives me a lot more to see and a lot more to do. I believe in putting, doing it and making the thing in reality instead of just drawing up a lot of numbers. There's a little bit of backbiting, but there's a lot around the world scientists, very high-powered scientists, that were involved in the old Star Wars program, talking a lot of this now. They get into the psychic aspects of it, also the, uh, the physics aspect of it also. A lot of the work is um, coming out and released uh, out of Lawrence Livermore. Uh, still, Los Alamos is a little tight, but it's slowly loosening up. Colonel Alexander now is into remote viewing. Uh, he's the head fellow involved in non-lethal weapon technology. He made an appearance on a program called Encounters. Ed Dames is now out of uh, the INSCOM group, the uh, Security Command group, and now is on sightings. So there's a wave of media also coming forth, um, such as these programs showing what is really going on. Even ABC and NBC did a special on is remote viewing true or false, and they've got a, a positive um, uh, situation on the one half hour program. And ABC, I believe, or NBC, one of the big networks in the States. So there's a lot of breakthrough in media coming slowly, but it's coming out more and more. And this will give people something to look at and think about. I think the mind can act as also a uh, cohere of frequencies and transmit them out, and then lock this doorway into space and time. Some measurements at Stanford University and UCLA, um, <coughs> Lawrence Livermore, and Dr. Henry Strapp, uh, William Tiller, put it at around 22 to 24 uh, centimeter wave, wave band that a lot of this activity happens at. And their tests are quite exhaustive and um, quite extensive, giving a lot of interesting results. <coughs> With McDonnell Douglas, they do a multitude of spoon bending, where they take control samples and then, of course, they put them under the electron scanning microscope to see if they were bent by force or by, by mind. So breakthroughs are being done by Mr. Jan of Princeton University, who also is connected to McDonnell Douglas. And I'm not surprised even now if they have come across a uh, formula on this um, area of physics, which has to be included. Everything is connected to everything else, in my opinion. Psychic to um, hardcore physics, let's say. Outer fringe physics, time and space. Cosmology, you name it.